Hello, dear listener. Welcome to episode 50 of the Alexa podcast. This isn't the podcast. This is just a little bit I'm doing at the beginning to let you know that the episode was recorded before the announcement of the general election happening on July the 4th. It was also recorded before, you know, Jeremy Corbyn announced that he's running as an independent candidate in Islington North. So if you're wondering why me and Alexi aren't addressing the humongous elephant in the room, that's why, because we didn't know it was going to happen because it hadn't happened yet. All right. Uh, That is to say, please listen to the very end, because at the end of the podcast, me and Alexi have a nice long chat about the world and some silliness as well. Um, But the main chunk of the podcast is an interview with Paul Curry. I hope you like it. Um, That interview was recorded in Alexi's living room. Uh, A little peek behind the curtain. When we record remotely, the sound quality is a lot easier to control. Whereas when we're in his living room and they're doing it in person, it can be a bit echoey sometimes. And I do everything I can with the audio. But, you know, this is a small independent production. We don't have that much equipment. We don't have a studio, that's for certain. Um, So, you know, uh, that is why sometimes the sound quality sounds different in the interview chunk. To the intro and outro the intro and outro is normally done remotely just me and alexi and that's a lot easier to control the sound so all you people giving me grief in the comments about the sound quality get off my back please you're hurting me right let's get to the show thank you hi everybody welcome to episode 50 what a milestone that is episode 50 of the alexi sale wow. podcast wow. Yeah, fireworks. Woo! Marching band. <laughs> 50. 50. So mm. we're going for a champagne lunch today to celebrate? Yeah, virtual champagne lunch. Yeah. <laughs> 50, it's a lot. It I know, is a lot. What, three and a half years, a lot of podcasts would have put out uh, a couple hundred by now. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we're not. We like don't rush that. things here, do we? No, we, we don't we put wanna... things out for the sake yeah. of it. No. So big news today. I have just come hot foot from the launch of uh, Andrew Feinstein's campaign to stand against Keir Starmer in this ward in which I live, and I've lived for over forty years. And uh, we'll put, we'll circle back to that. But I just, if you live in uh, Holborn and St Pancras. I would recommend Andrew Feinstein as your parliamentary candidate when the election rolls around. Mm. Uh, He is standing against um, the evil Ewok that is is Keir Starmer. Um, So, hairless Ewok, (laughs) but the same. No, I don't mean Ewok. What's the little? What's the small creatures? Sort of in the in the monk's robes. The Oh, the, oh, well, in the desert. Yeah. Yeah, they pick up the scrap and stuff. I, I don't remember what they're called, but they're meant to be little Arabs, aren't they? Oh, really? Oh, well, that's well there is a lot of connotation of like, yeah. they're like nomadic and desert. Which ones are the Ewoks then? Ewoks are the little fuzzy teddy bears oh, right, in right. Jedi. In Return well, they're quite, the they can be quite evil, can't they, the Ewoks? Um, they eat, I, no, I <laughs> <laughs> Let's just yeah yeah. yeah let's not get maybe into that, when yeah. the camera's not rolling, they uh, eat, <laughs> eat their young and um, they fornicate with um, plant life and stuff. Um, <laughs> but no, the Ewoks are famously meant to be the the good guys. I thought you were just commenting on his high pitched voice. All right, maybe I am. I don't know. I've lost track. <laughs> I've completely lost track of where this is going. Anyway, <laughs> Andrew um, Feinstein. Andrew uh, Feinstein. Vote, vote, vote. We're going to be. I hope to be um, part of his campaign, and he is a an exemplary. We'll, we'll, he is, and we'll talk about that at the end of the podcast right. but, because we got a big one today. Haven't yeah, we? this is a big one, people. This is the one that's gonna that's gonna break us out. This is we have a we have the first interview that Paul Curry and Paul Curry was well. Oh, I don't know. Do you want to explain what happened to Paul Curry? Yeah, we'll get into the into it in the podcast. But uh, yeah, he in February he was slandered mercilessly in the press, uh, and uh, thanks to the campaign against anti-Semitism, they 
spread some uh, nasty lies about him completely mis um, misrepresenting a situation in his gig you may have seen him on the headlines of the bbc and daily mail and all that you know what were the headlines like vicious anti-semite nazi kicks jew out of theater because of their you know because of their visible jewishness or whatever yeah. you know there was just saying horrible shit and that's what all the headlines were saying yeah unanimously and none of them reached out to him and asked him what actually happened and actually all mm. it was was a comedian throwing a heckler out of his show yeah. that's all it was and had no reason to know he was jewish or, or think he was jewish and in fact it wasn't just jewish he was an ex-idf israeli zionist who was being racist in 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 the audience and um for the safety of the show and the audience and you know people were turning on the heckler uh, paul curry got him out of the show yeah I believe um but th all that will you might remember that from the news yeah. and all that's going to be explained in detail by paul curry for the first time here on the alexis cell podcast isn't that wicked alexi <laughs> it is wicked and it is. let's go ahead do it right now <laughs> Everybody and I think this is uh, this is the first scoop. I think scoop would be a not too big a word for a sensational achievement for the Alexis L podcast. We have the first interview uh, from uh, Paul Curry, uh, comedian, and well, we'll get into you know how he became centre of on the front pages for a few days. Uh, Eventually, but I, I, hi Paul, welcome. Hi, hi Alexi. It's an honour to be here. Well, good. It's good to have you. So I, I guess just, I mean, start with tell us about you. You were, you know, how you became a comic and you know, uh, anything you want. Really. Um, I, I played in punk bands in Belfast in the nineties. Uh, that was my first foray. Did you go to college, or you I did. I went to art college. Yeah. Ah, another another one. yeah. Another art school. Yeah, I went to art school in Belfast for many years. And uh, what's that like as a college, Belfast? Art it's good. It's flattened now. The one I was at, really, it's gone. It's gone, and it was quite an iconic building as well. Um, it was called the Connor Hall, named after uh, Connor. Um, I've forgotten his first name, but he was a famous uh, Belfast artist who uh -huh. painted a lot of street street life uh -huh. in Belfast, and a lot of iconic punk bands played in the uh, Connor Hall back in the day as well too. No, uh, no means no. Sonic Youth. Stuff like that, sort of real underground punk bands, but it's gone. They rebuilt it, um, but it was a great. It was it was a, it was disgusting. It was a real shabby. That's why they knocked it down. But, I know it's uh, right. yeah. It's not. It's all very fancy modern architecture. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I studied um, visual communication, the more commercial end of. Uh, That's what we used to call graphics. Graphic yeah. art. Yeah, I don't know, but I ended up kind of twisting it to more sort of uh, installation art that I did. So I did some installation video pieces. Um, so they were all, I don't know how this system, I mean, I, I, how does the art school system work in Northern Ireland? Is it the same as here or is it? I think it's, yeah, it's pretty much the same, yeah. I did didn't want to do a master's or anything. I just did a degree. I got, I got a degree. Did you foundation as well? Yeah. yeah at yeah. Belfast? Uh, yeah. yeah. So you were there for, what, four years? I did the foundation in a different part of Belfast in a separate building uh -huh. and then transferred to the bigger art college um, and then graduated from there in 98, 1998. Okay. So, yeah. So I pretty much spent all of the 90s in further and higher education because before that, I was doing performing arts. Okay. So I dropped out of performing arts in the early 90s and then went to art college, realized I didn't want to be an actor. I was at the Edinburgh Fringe for the first time in 91. With a Yates play. Right. A Yates play. Yeah, it was very Are short. They? Very short. Yeah, very <laughs> short ones. We did, have the, we did the Hawkswell and the right. Cat in the Moon. Very, right. very short little. I only know the poetry. I didn't know he was. Yeah, he did a couple right. of short plays, which we did. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was my, yeah. But it was in punk bands before the, before the performing arts. Right. So that's, uh, most of the 90s was in artistic 
further education with uh, college stuff? Was that when we were talking? I mean, I, I mean, it's well, I don't know. We, we we were talking before we started recording yeah. really about um, trauma and the, the the troubles and you know. Yeah. I first I think performed in. Um, I must have performed in Belfast. I think it uh it in probably 82 83 right, okay. and you know there was uh i mean i think they were a highland regiment i remember um uh seeing this you know a patrol through the streets of you know the central uh, with kind of berets with pom-poms on yeah. and i remember they had the big old the big <laughs> this might they had the british l1a1 assault rifle which was the uh oh. 7.62 millimeter. Uh, Did you uh, get excited? Rifle. Did you get excited about that? Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. ooh, I haven't seen one in the real no, no, life. No, that, that was the standard <laughs> British Army uh, yeah. battle rifle at the time. <laughs> um, so we were. I mean, I, I mean, I recently did uh, one of my episodes of Strangers on the Train in Northern Ireland, uh, yeah. Belfast, today. yeah. And I kind of avoided, in a way talking to the people about the troubles. I mean, it initially, inevitably came up, but I thought it, it, that I didn't necessarily want to, I don't know, just, I, just, I was interested Dread in talking up. about more ordinary things. Yeah. But, I mean, it is nevertheless, it is clearly, a, 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 you know, for you it was a central yeah, part it's... of your experience. And, and you were saying before we started recording that it informs the performer that you became yeah, later, yeah. so maybe you could talk about it. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I've, whenever I ventured into uh, doing stand-up comedy, I mean, I'd been brought up on The Young Ones, Monty Python, and then, ergo, I, I traced the, the origins of Python back to the Goons and, and Milligan, so uh, I was a big fan of them and listened to a lot of recordings of them. <clears throat> um, so I came from a very surrealist point of view with my stand-up. Right. I specifically went down that more Andy Kaufman, you know, right. test in the audience kind of thing, you know. Right. And also I wanted to, I consciously wanted to break people's um, concepts of what a stand-up comedian from Northern Ireland talks about. Right. I wanted yeah, to yeah. break that yeah. just by being weird. So people would then go, <laughs> after the gig, would go, where the hell is he from? Belfast? Right. And then completely break any any preconceptions that they had about... Because right. I, I would cover up my accent as well. I would, oh, do, really? I would do numerous types of accents. I would do from posh English, you know, goons-esque. You know, I was going down the Sellers, Peter Sellers route of, right, right. of just throwing my accent everywhere so people couldn't pin it down. Right. So that when I walked out on the stage, they didn't immediately make a judgment on me, you know. So I made a conscious effort to do that, but in a clowning, kind of clown way, you know, physical comedy way. Do you think that was also informed by your art school experiences and your exposure to, like, performance arts and... Um... Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I mean, uh, I was also heavily influenced by Steve Martin as well, too. And it was actually listening to his album and seeing him live that I realised that was my... That, that's what pushed me into doing stand-up. Because I was obsessed with Vic and Bob. I was right. obsessed with Python, but they were all teams and groups. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know how to do it as a one as one person yeah, on the stage. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I saw Steve Martin doing it, he was right. a one-man cabaret variety act. Right. I was like, shit, shit, you can do it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. can make balloon animals. You can pull shit out of a, you know, a suitcase. You can yes. Do whatever yes. the hell you want. Yes. I mean, that's something that's you know. inspired about Steve Martin, is it? That, that, well, I remember him, I mean, him saying, I mean... Which is not, you know, if you know how to do something as a comic, you will find yourself doing it, you know. Yeah. And he could roller skate and play the banjo, and he found himself roller skating while playing the banjo, yeah. you know. But I, I actually think that that's not necessarily the case. There is a, a type of comic that I don't particularly like, well, like who just stands there and talks. Really. Yeah, and I... And that's not my idea of standing either. up in a sense. Me either, but I have so much respect for the people that can do that with just, yeah. just a microphone. As the, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Just a the story as, yeah. a, as a prop, mm. you know. I have a lot of respect for that, but it's not my... It's like I would walk in the art gallery. I Watercolours are fine, right. but it doesn't do it for me. Right. So, you know, I much prefer yeah. the more surrealist stuff that really encourage, that like pushes your, your brain a bit more, you know. So how did you... Well, how did you get started, I suppose? I mean, where did you perform and how On the street. That... In fact, still walking. <laughs> still walking was my first uh, foray into doing solo performance to... I cried, was still walking. So I teach in the Belfast Circus School. Right. I've been doing that since uh, 2000. 
and I teach the wee ones. We teach a little group called the Itty, Itty Bitty Circus. We also teach adults, and um, but I specifically teach the wee ones, two to seven year olds. And then I also do outreach workshops with uh, adults and teenagers with special needs. So um, I do that as well too. Yeah. But my first performances were on stilts. We would do a two hour stilt walking gig and you were just left on your own to go and walk around the event, whatever the event might be. Mm. So it would be at a festival? Festival or even the street. The council would pay us to like go out and just entertain people at a certain time of night um, to bring a bit of really? colour. Because the Belfast City Council had a lot of money back in the early noughties. So right. they were just like throwing it at us going, right. six stilt walkers walking up and down Royal <laughs> Avenue. So you'd have That's to, what we need. and you learn, yeah, you learn pretty quick as well uh, when the uh, when people arrive in the time to go to the pubs or when yeah. the pubs come out. Because if you're on a set of stilts, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, target. you're a target yeah, for yeah, yeah. A, a group of six yeah. uh, drunken oh, men or women, to be honest. Because you're at the groping height, oh right, <laughs> crotch or bum, and so right. you'd, you'd kind of hold on to a lamp post. Yeah. As they were walking past. <laughs> so yeah, that Is was that my. Hard, still walking on the <laughs> Is it hard? Is it difficult? Well, yeah. it, it takes a few weeks just to build up the confidence to, and then you learn how to you fall. You have to learn how to fall properly. Yeah. On your knees, we wear knee pads. Right. So if you're going to fall, you fall yeah. onto your knees, not your yeah wrists you or your, your wrists. Yeah, yeah. Break your wrists. A few yeah. friends have done that. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So that's how you started. That's how I started in. So we, but Belfast uh, City Council. Yeah. Dest- decided that the best way to counter the effects of. 30, 40 years of civil war was yeah. people circus. on stilts. Circus. Circus, yeah. Why not? Yeah, Which yeah. was ironically, it was set up by an Australian. Right. Who came all the way back. An Australian. Yeah. Uh, who was descended from Irish settlers right. in Australia. Came back to Belfast and set up a guy called Mike Maloney, who sadly passed away. Uh, he set up the Belfast Circus Guild. Right. And uh, do you know Martin Big Pig? He's a stand-up comedian. No. He does a bit of writing for Frankie Boyle. Anyway. No, no. He, uh, okay, he's, uh, he's a stand-up comedian. He, he was also one of the uh, founders of the uh, Belfast Circus. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So, I was basically doing two-hour stilt-walking gigs. I went to a comedy club one night in the Empire. I'm sure you know the Empire Comedy Club in Belfast, maybe. I don't. You, you're, you're thinking you're mixing me up. <laughs> Somebody who lives in the 21st century. Uh, <laughs> so I, went, I basically went to a stand up comedy club, saw somebody do a five minute spot, right. and went, they just, What, five minutes? And I do like two to three hours still walking. Yeah. I was like, I could, I could do that. Right. Surely I could do that. So that's why whenever I started then. And then seeing Steve Martin, and then I just pushed myself onto the stage. What was the stand up scene in Belfast? So what, what year would this be? That would have been. 93. What was the comedy scene like? 93, 94. It was really small, really small. Uh, in fact, the night I went to that comedy club, it was a very young Tommy Tiernan. Right. He was performing at the end. I know who he is. I know him. <laughs> I know that one. Um, he was he was performing. He had a lot more hair by then. Right. And uh, no beard. And um, yeah, I just remember seeing a couple of... He was the main headliner and then a couple of people doing five-minute spots. And I thought, oh, fucking hell, I could try this. So, so what did you do? Did you do stilts on the stage? What did he do? No, my concept was, this is how I got my head around the uh, nerves, was that stilts, the foot plates on stilts are like tiny stages. Right. So uh, essentially a stage is like one big massive stilt. Right. When you're up above the audience, yeah. you know, because yeah, you are raised to yeah. a certain degree. You're, there's a bit of a level change. So uh, that's, that's how I convinced myself I could do it. Because, uh, I mean, I would go to comedy clubs and just be in awe of these one person on stage captivating an entire audience who have paid to be make me laugh. Yeah. Whereas when you're on stilts, it's a different, it's it's a lot easier because you're on stilts and you've already got that awe factor that you're right. on stilts. Then the comedy comes after, whereas comedy club is like, they've paid, you better make me laugh. Right. So there's more pressure, obviously, on you then. I never thought of it like, now you've got me worried. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, anyway, anyway, so so you so you progress I mean, open spots and then you start getting paid in Belfast. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, I didn't, I didn't transition into weird comedy. I just went straight for it. Really? Like, yeah, I just went for it big time. And um, so I was bringing props on stage and um, doing weird bits inspired by Andy Kaufman and Steve Martin. And um, I mean, I suppose Andy would tell us a bit about. I mean, Andy Kaufman for those. 
I mean, came to fame over here as, as Lacka Gravis in yeah, ta- Taxi. In Taxi. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But um, uh, he was. Uh, well, I know there was a Jim Carrey film called Man mm. on the Moon, isn't yeah. it? which was about Andy yeah. Kaufman. But so I, I mean, guess tell us a bit about Andy Kaufman. Right? Well, I mean, I saw The Man on the Moon. I kind of had a. I'd heard a little bit about his alternative comedy that mm. he'd done stand up, but of course, I'd only known him from Taxi. So. That was, um, I just like researching stuff. So whenever I found out that he wasn't just this TV sitcom yeah. character. And I mean, you could tell in a way that it was something different about him just from the energy that he brought yeah, to that. Yeah, absolutely. The sitcom was, uh, and he, uh, you know. He, could, he was barely in a lot of scenes, but he absolutely stole it. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Um, so I researched pre-YouTube. I uh, ordered all these DVDs from a... Uh, from a uh, a dealer, uh, a sort of um, of rare video footage right. on the internet of every bit of footage I could find of Andy Kaufman performing. And I think it's, I think it's, do you think it's better when you have to make a bit of an effort rather than... Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's not just straight on YouTube. Yeah. So I had, to, I had to wait for these to come through in the post and DVDs. So I have a collection of all these DVDs of like really rare footage of, of Kaufman that some of it I don't think even has, has been uploaded on the YouTube. Right. And I watched that and I just absorbed that as much as I could and then started to write my own kind of versions of of that. Like there was a sketch where he just sat, press record on a tape recorder to canned laughter. Right. And ate a bowl of ice cream right. on stage. And I then <laughs> transitioned to a piece that I do now, which I've done for years now, where I eat a bowl of cereal right. on stage and just uh, have a breakdown to the... <laughs> Have a have a breakdown to the theme tune of Arthur. Right. So as that transitions into the saxophone break in the uh, Arthur theme tune right. by Christopher Cross, I yeah. then start spitting the cornflakes over the yeah. whole audience and tell them I'm dripping in milk and the front yeah. rows dripping in milk yeah. and and uh, it's become quite a famous bit that I do where people are. Right. I saw you do that in Edinburgh in probably the hottest room I've ever been in. So like, <laughs> yeah. we're all sweaty and sticky and now we're covered in this fucking spitty milk. Yeah, milk and cornflakes. Um, and... But um, yeah. I've seen Paul multiple times in Edinburgh um, and he's, his his show is so good. His performance, his performing is it's mo- it's mostly without words. And uh, Yeah, well, the, the, the Soho show, the one that was completely non-verbal. Yeah. That was the first time I ever thought, I, I, I'm going to try and do a completely non-verbal show. So um, that was... He, he's a, I just want to let the audience know that you're you're one of my favourites and I would make sure every time I was in Edinburgh oh, I'd you. come and see you. Um, yeah. Beautifully crafted. You you give the sense of chaos and, un, and unpredictability, but you can tell that it's beautifully choreographed, really thoughtful and uh, powerful sometimes. And then just gloriously silly and yeah everyone you always pack the house at edinburgh as well you, you know it's, uh, it's... Thir- thir- 13 years of going back every year tenaciousness you know because i did the like, first year i two people all right you know i did that i've, I've been through the whole uh, i learned very quickly to because i don't have management i've never had management or, or agents or anything like that i did i did go to edinburgh one year with avalon <laughs> <laughs> what? Glad, glad you did that. Um, um, I did that Funny. once under the under the wing of the eagle of Avalon, and uh, and I thought, you know, because I read up on the Avalon rostra, yeah. I was like, oh my god, yeah. wow, all these, and uh, learned very quickly because I'm from a very punk background, right. very DIY punk background, and as soon as I read their contract, right, that they yeah. gave me, and I gave it to a friend who was a lawyer in Belfast, and they were like. Don't sign this. Yeah. And uh, they said, change this, change this, change this. And I gave it back to Avalon and they just went, what? Um, I'm sorry. Who are you? <laughs> and I was like, I'll sign it if you change these. And yeah. they were like, just like, nah. So you didn't have I just thought. went, no. I, I, like I told them I'm not going to sign yeah. this. So they took me up to Edinburgh right. with the with the idea that I would sign with them after Edinburgh. Right. I read the contract after Edinburgh right. and went, no. Yeah, uh, that was an eye opener for me. Yeah, that was an eye opener for me. Yeah, and I mean, did that? I mean, what, what, where, what, where, what are your goals? And I mean, do you, do you see it in that way in terms of a career? Really, I guess I did. I guess I did at one point. Right. I mean, I'm what nearly twenty years into doing it now, and uh, 
Yeah, I had those dreams and aspirations for a while when I was um, when I was starting out. But um, like I said, I, I started seeing behind the wizard wizard's curtain <laughs> quite quickly, right? And realized that it wasn't everything that I hoped it would be. I mean, yeah, I dream about being a taskmaster. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that's never going to happen right. ever ever uh, and so many people have messaged me over the years going why are you not on Taskmaster you should yeah. do that I'm like yeah, it's not going to happen I mean it's owned by uh, it's owned by Avalon isn't it it's just, yeah. yeah it's so never going to happen but I, I'm just look right. genuinely happy just to be out there making people laugh I mean I'm a clown at heart so I mean can we jump to your to the the, so the, yes, so how are the events of when was it now? The events. The events of February. 10th. If I may, if I may. <laughs> oh, the, be, I feel like we should be wearing wigs. Attention. Should be wearing wigs at this point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So February tenth, uh, twenty twenty four. Dun 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 dun. Um, bon, bon. So in the morning. <laughs> uh, it was a morning. Like any other. Yeah. Uh, I heard tell that there was a Palestinian march happening in Camberwell, where I was staying. So I, 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 of course, being the diligent humanitarian that I am, went on the march. Two and a half miles it was. Wasn't expecting it to be quite that long. <laughs> um, but it was, a, it was a really beautifully condensed little uh, group of people that right. congregated on Camberwell Green. We went right. for a walk right up the whole way up to Tate yeah. Water. So it was great. It was very passionate, and it was a very small group. But fair play, I have to say, fair play to the police. They were the police abuse. Do you know what I mean? They were yeah. fucking brilliant. They, yeah. they kept this clear. There was a lot of abuse being shouted at, at because it was a small group, right? Of about must have been about forty to fifty people. It wasn't a huge throng, but we eventually got up to the Tate Modern at the back of the Tate Modern, and there was a much bigger uh, gathering. And we did that, and we listened to a lot of the speeches, and there was a lot of impassioned speech. You know. Just about the, mur- the, the the murders of the children that were happening, especially uh, particularly on that day. I think there'd be more reports coming in. Right. So yeah, we did that. I had the gig that night. I l- uploaded a video onto my Instagram of us walking along and uh, whatnot, and shouting ceasefire and whatnot. And then I went and did the gig that night. So I guess that was kind of you know in the back of my head, still sort of fresh in the back of my head. It was the last night. We did, I was doing three shows. It was the final night. It was a full show, full sold out show. And the whole, the whole Stum. show, Stum. Stum. Which is ironically Yiddish. Stum, yeah. That's the name Sorry, of the show, yeah. Stum. Although we said, and I mean, it said, we use it a lot in Belfast and yeah, Scotland yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Keep Stum, keep your Stum. So that, that was. This was downstairs and so was this Yeah, in the cabaret room and downstairs, yeah. yeah. I know it well. And uh, the show went well. Um, and I did the the bit in the near the end of the show where I and I, I did it previously in Edinburgh the, the year before, where it was just the Ukrainian flag that I held up in this particular sketch that I do, and it was to the music of John Farnham, and the the music cuts on a particular line where he says we're not going to sit in silence, right? Where I cut the music at that point and I just edited it with uh, the awkward drip of a tap. Right. And an, empty, an echoing drip of a tap just to emphasize the awkwardness and the the magnitude of people not speaking out about conflicts. And that's what that whole bit was about, was about right. conflicts. It wasn't specifically about Ukraine. It wasn't specifically about Palestine. But because I'd only used the Ukraine flag the year before and then everything that happened mm-hmm. on October the 7th and after that, um, I thought I, I felt like I'd be cheating myself as a performer, as an artist, not to um, emphasize that. So I said to a friend before I was going to London, I was like, could I have a land of uh, your, your Palestinian flag? Because I'm going to use that and that. And it was, uh, and it's quite a short bit. I have to hold up both flags yeah. and then get on with the, it's, it's, and I mean, to be fair, I could have held up numerous amounts of flags of other conflicts and wars that are happening right now, but it's a very short sketch. So I just did Ukraine and Palestine and then threw them away and sit in silence with the whole audience, which gets a huge awkward laugh because everyone, just before that, if I'll put it into context, I'm having a bread fight with the audience before that. Okay. So I hand out loaves of bread to right. the uh, the theme tune of the um, Hovis right. song comes in and I start handing out 
slices of bread like the you know like in the catholic church yeah and i'm kind of blessing people and uh whatever and everybody so then everybody rips up the bread they've all got bits of bread and then at a certain point in the the hova song it stops and then this hardcore acid dance song comes on and the and i just hold up a sign that says bread fight on it and everybody just gets in their bread fight so it's a, a 140 adults all throwing bits of bread at each other um silliness but yeah. there is a more uh, there's a more serious bit to it which is um i write bread written in b-r-e-d which is about humans just being bred right. to fight as tribes tribalism how everybody instantly gets into a fight into a war into a conflict super quick and that's what happens in the bread fight everyone's having great fun thrown right um so that happens and then and then the uh Everyone's hyped up after having a bread fight and uh, John Farnham kicks in and I'm getting everyone to kind of, yeah, you're the voice trying on this time. Right. We're not going to sit in silence. Right. Trip, trip, trip. So everyone's like, oh shit. Right. And then I mime a TV and I mime a TV remote control and just sort of, you know, dormantly sit and watching the TV the way everyone is. And then I don't say anything. I just shrug my shoulders and go, you, you know, Right. You'd be the judge of what we're not doing or okay. doing. And that's what that whole bit is about. It's about conflict and how everyone's just kind of sitting around doing nothing really, you know, um, or not enough people are saying stuff. Uh, and, and it's in a non-verbal show, so it's perfect for, for what I'm trying to emphasize. Then I move on to the next sketch. Do you want me to explain all this? Yeah. Yeah. I move on to the next sketch, uh, which is um, uh, Rainbow Connection, sung by Jim Henson. Now, the connection with that for me is that I'm a Jim Henson Muppeteer. Right. I studied with uh, the Henson Company, came over to Belfast. We did a two seasons of what was called Sesame Tree, which was the U, supposed to be the UK version of Sesame Street. Mm. It only lasted two seasons. But what Sesame Street have is around the world, they go to the production company, go to places of conflict where there needs to be conflict resolution. Right. Of course, the, the main place in the UK Yes. It's Belfast. Yeah, right. So they did it in Belfast. We did two seasons. Um, and uh, we, I was very lucky to get to perform with Carol Spinney before he passed away, who was Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch. So I got to meet him as well. So I put on Kermit the Frog in this penultimate sketch where he's singing Rainbow Connection. But in the middle of the sketch, um, I take Kermit off my hand and just drape him dead on a table behind me and I continued performing with a naked hand right. to the whole song. And uh, the metaphor f behind that for me is about the children that are, that are being killed in conflicts who are never going to get to fulfill their childhood dreams, which my childhood dream was to be a Jim Henson Muppet. Right. I was obsessed with Sesame Street, obsessed with the Muppets. And I finally got to, to uh, fulfill that. So these children mm. are never going to get to do any of that, you know, and uh, so that is an emotional piece. And a lot of people are crying in the show to that bit. You know, I do it very straight. It's not a, a comical bit. It is more of a poignant performance art piece, you know. And then I finish with that. Take a bow behind the table that Kermit's draped over, the dead Kermit. And uh, I pull out a set of massive angel wings. Right. And this is a metaphor and it's a sort of a homage to Terry Gilliam's Brazil mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and the song Brazil kicks in which is a really joyous song I go to jump with the wings on goes to blackout and then I resort to a tiny little version of me which is a little action man puppet with a pair of wings and then I fly <laughs> over the audience the entire <laughs> audience because he's spotlit with a little torch at one right. end of the stick and so it's <laughs> Just goes to blackout, I'm flying over the audience, away from this dystopian nightmare, which is, of course, what Brazil is about, and which we're all living through right now. Indeed. Indeed, yeah. And uh, and that's it. Um, lights come up. I take a bow. Um, the Palestinian-Ukrainian sketch is way behind us at this yeah. point. It's gone. And uh, I... You, did, uh, you didn't fully explain that, the, the pulling out the flags bit. Oh, did I not? No, you, you. No, that's what you did. We, oh, sorry. We so off on a, you were talking about the yeah. So the John Farnham, the, the the John Farnham song kicks in. I pull out the Ukraine flag. Yeah, pulled it up. You said that it was back then. Pulled out the uh, Palestinian flag, yeah, yeah, put it away, yeah. and then. You did? Yeah, you said that. Forgive me. Oh, that's all right. Oh, shut up. <laughs> um, 
So the mini, mini me on the stick is now on the, along with all the other props, the, the whole stage is mm-hmm. strewn in props, bread, milk, mm-hmm. um, confetti, all sorts of things. Um, I then do this fake bit where there's, there's already a stool sitting on the stage. I sit down and start um, pretending to be an audience member giving me a standing ovation. And it usually works nine times out of ten. Everybody starts, I'm sort of going... <gasps> And everybody's sort of going, okay, we're going with this. And they, they give me a standard ovation. Not everybody does it. Right. Not everybody does it. And I'm not expecting everybody to do it because it's just a stupid, fake, um, you know, egot- you know fake yeah. egotistical cry for, please give me a standard ovation. Right. Um, everybody stands up. Not everybody does. And I'm aware at this point that there's, um, I'm aware at this point, <laughs> there's people to the right of me who haven't stood up. In fact, there was people stewing around because I can see they're quite obvious um, that people haven't stood up. So I get everyone to sit down. Show's basically over at this point. I take the microphone and I do what I do in every show, which is do the whole kind of, it's very Steve Martin-esque as well. <laughs> thank you, right. everybody, for the standing ovation and thank you guys for not standing up. You know, right. and that's it. That's what I said. The next bit, this is where it all goes pear-shaped. Yeah. People start booing in the front row. Really? And I'm not aware of what's happened, but people start booing, and I immediately assume that they're booing at me. Right. So I'm like, what the hell's just happened? So there's just this joy of a standing ovation. Everyone's, you know, uh, the Kermit the Frog song still lingering in the air. Brazil's still. And um, I'm aware that something's happened over here with the people that hadn't stood up, or a group of them. And um, I'm trying to look at the eye you know, where these people are looking. And I'm aware that it's two people sitting a couple of rows back or a guy that's sitting a couple of rows back. And I stop these people booing because I'm, you know, I don't want to finish. It's my last night at Soho. Yeah. I don't want to finish on a negative vibe in the room. So I stop them booing and I have to then go over to him. Now he's heckled. And in the interviews... Guy, two rows back, yeah. Yeah, he's heckled, but this has come out. I only found this out, um, what it was exactly he said in interviews, like but weeks after... He admitted to saying, um, thanks for holding up the Palestinian flag, as in, thank you for, you know, like... Yeah. So he retorted back to me on that. But I wasn't specifically talking to him. I was talking to everybody that didn't stand up. Um, so he heckles me. They start booing. I look over and try to find out exactly what he said. He says, uh, he said... I said, no, sorry. I said to him, so you didn't enjoy the show? You genuinely didn't enjoy the show? And he went, No. <coughs> And I was like, right, okay. People start hissing and booing him again. I go like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Because everyone at this point, obviously, I've just finished one hour. Everyone's on yeah. my side. But I, again, I don't want I don't want conflict in my show. Right. So I'm going, please, please, hang on a minute till I figure this out. And I looked at him and said, are you, being, are you being sarcastic right now? Are you being serious? And he went, yeah, I hate that flag. And I was like, what? What? Are you? And I said to him, are you being sarcastic? Because yeah. I can't read him because he's got this big arrogant grin on his face and I can't tell if he's just joshing with me just sort of trying to wind me up um I'm also trying to figure out from a stand-up comedian point of view trying to deal with a heckler trying to figure yeah, out yeah. is he drunk yeah is he on something is he ser- sober and serious yeah. is he is he being racist is this genuine like hatred coming from him or is he just mucking around and trying to fuck with me and play with my play with my head so I say to him are you being sarcastic directly at him and he goes Big smile on his face, nods yeah. his head, nods his head. Yes, I am. Right. So I go, oh, cool, great. And I look at the audience and go, it's fine. We're all good. He's just winding me up. He's being sarcastic. I look back at him and go, right? Thumbs up. You, you're being sarcastic, right? And then he shakes his head, no. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? In my head, I'm, I'm thinking I'm being gaslit here right in front of this audience. This guy's just mucking with me, right? And I'm like, hang on a minute. So you're being sarcastic. Oh, so you're not being sarcastic. And he says, no. Then at this point, and my clown head, my improv head kicks in. And I'm thinking, I need to deal with this because this is getting weird. He could be, you know, dangerous or hateful in some way. And I don't want this coming into the room. So I look at the audience with the microphone in hand and go, don't worry. This is a part of the show. <laughs> it's all good. And I look back at him and go, right. Remember we rehearsed this? Yeah, this is a part of the show. Yeah. But this, this wasn't where you were meant to. Yeah, you've kind of fucked it up a bit. And he goes, no, no, no. I hate that flag and I hate you for using it in your show. And I'm like, what, dude? And I'm kind of wanting them to just back down off this. Right. I don't want them to go there. And um, 
I say to him, look, mate, um, you do realize that bit because I start getting a little bit serious about this. And yeah. I'm like, you realize that bit was about ceasefires. Okay. And I'm from Belfast and ceasefires are pretty important to us in Belfast. Extremely important. I lived through a ceasefire. Yeah. And people in Belfast know more about ceasefires than any part of the UK. Yeah. So you need to, he just smiles and shrugs it off and looks at me like I'm a piece of shit, like, like, you know, it's at that point then whenever it just sort of shows absolutely no respect at all whatsoever for what I've just, the effort I've just put in for the last hour in a show that's about humanitarianism, about peace. Um, I then lose it and just go, look, mate, read the room. Just go, just, just fucking go, please just leave. Um, and he sits back in his chair, folds his arms in a very cocky fashion and he's still smiling. And I'm like, just get the fuck out, get the fuck out. And people in the front row are just shouting, get the fuck out as well. It's just leave. People are going leave because they're just getting this hatred that he's, he's just right. exerting this hatred, you know, mm. this xenophobia, this basic racism, right, in front of me towards a singular flag. And I said to him, like, what, you know, before, sorry, before that, I'd asked him which flag was it, and he specifically said it was the Palestinian right. flag. So yeah. I was like, you need to go. You just need to go because I don't want this level of hatred in my, in my room, and I don't want to finish the last show like this. So I tell him to get the fuck out and that I'm being serious. So he stands up and then his friend next to him stands up and they start putting their coat on really, really slowly, antagonistically slowly. And again, he's still smiling, smirking away. He's so cool and calm, which is freaking me out even more because I've never seen a heckler do this. Yeah. Sober. I've seen him doing it drunk. Yeah. But he was clearly sober, right? He then chooses to walk through the two rows in front of him onto the stage, which is fully lit because the house lights aren't up. He could have left in the dark. Yeah. He chose to walk right onto the stage, which weirded me out even more. I stood yeah. back because it's not a big stage. I stood back to let him pass. At which point he's smiling at me. And there's been witnesses, all the witnesses in the front row have corroborated this, that he was, uh, and, and verified, sorry, that he was uh, smiling and not in any way intimidated whatsoever. And um, smile at me, smile at some of the people in the front row. And it's at that point, I just, his arrogance just like really got to me and I just held up both flags and went, which one was it? Hmm. Which one was it you didn't like? And held out the Palestinian flag and went, mate, it was about ceasefires, yeah, ceasefires now. And then the whole audience kicked off shouting ceasefires now as he walked out, again, smugly grinning. I mean, he walked across the stage like he was, yeah. like he was on he a catwalk. He didn't have to do that. Too. He did not have to do that. No, okay, he didn't. He um, um, I have to emphasize, in my brain, in my comedian's brain of doing comedy for, you know, for over 25 years now, where you're trying to read the person who's bringing this hatred in. Um, I assumed that he was some kind of posh London twat. Yeah. He was really well dressed, really handsome. He was a very handsome young man. And uh, I just, that's, after going on the march that day and everybody shouting abuse at us, I just, you know, you're aware that people just don't like the Palestinian flag. They just mm. hate it because it oh, interrupts their day. Right. Mm. And that's it. And that's all I was getting from him. It was like, oh, oh God, not another, you know. Uh. Right. And I tried to explain to him calmly, you know, because I know the reports were like, I just lost it straight away and kicked him out. I was trying to calm the audience down against him, but he just kept digging a hole for himself. And it's that point I told him to get the fuck out. So he left. He leaves the room that everybody shouting ceasefire and I, at which point then I say, if anybody else doesn't agree with a ceasefire, you can fuck off as well. Uh, four or five people in the front get up and walked out. They were an older crowd. They didn't even really seem to be enjoying the show that much anyway. Throughout the right. Day. So they left, leaving about 140 odd people in the room, to which point I'm still trying to play on the whole, this is a part of the show. This is an Andy Kaufman bit. Right. This is all a big setup. They leave the room, at which point I look at the staff who are standing over at the bar going, what the fuck? <laughs> Most of the audience are going, what the fuck? Is this, is this a real thing? And then I look at the staff and go, okay, they know they're supposed to come back in again, right? Yeah. Oh, no. And I'm sort of playing on the whole, oh, they fuck this. Like, you know, we've really messed up this bit. And, uh, and then I just drop my whole shtick and just tell the audience, look, um, and then uh, I basically say, look, the reason why I'm so angry is that what's happening right now over in Palestine, if the British government had taken the same stance against the IRA, sorry, if the British government had taken the same stance against the IRA in the 1970s um, as Israel are against 
Hamas and the Palestinians right now, I wouldn't, you know, like, you wouldn't be here. Yeah. Because I wouldn't be here. Because I would have been a dead, dead baby. Yeah. I would have been a dead baby under the rubble in 1974, which was at the height of the troubles when yeah. I was born. Um, and uh, I just said, you know, um, I don't condone, never can I don't condone any form of terrorism or violence. Um, but the IRA didn't speak for the people of Belfast and Hamas do not speak for the people of Palestine. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. And uh, to se the self-defense thing, you know, <laughs> Belfast would have been flat yeah, if yeah. the British have, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I made that I made that point and just said, look, and and uh, and I'm angry about I uh, think about all those children as well too, who could have been comedians or performers or you know surgeons, yeah, doctors, yeah. whatever. They're all it's gone. They're that's completely gone. And then I just left the stage. And, right. You know. Thinking could, and then and then what happened? And then I went upstairs to the Soho Bar for two hours, right. chatting to most of the audience who came up and thanked me for uh, doing what I did. Right. Um, a lot of Jewish members of the audience came up and were saying, thank you so much for speaking out about that. People from the Middle East who were in the audience, people of color, people come up and said, wow, holy shit, two hours in the Soho Bar having drinks. Um, Ian offered a lot of other gigs around <laughs> right. London, ironically. And then the next day, I start getting uh, emails uh, from... Um, really heavy right-wing Zionist hate mail. Really? Yeah, death threats to me and my family. Um, uh, and it just spiraled until... And I, I, I just stopped looking at my emails at that point. Um, so they had your email or you... That was like... Your see, this is what... I, I don't use Facebook anymore, but uh, somebody made aware, made it aware, made me aware on Monday. Um, because the next day, I pretty much had my phone switched off. Anyway... Um, that my email was uh, was available on my Facebook page right. my, uh, and my phone number, uh, so I was getting texts and emails, right. you know, from all these uh, like it, I literally three thousand emails. Yeah, yeah, fascist, yeah, yeah. And I sat and um, had to delete all these emails on the uh, on the Monday on the boat on the way home. Um, so I was driving back from London to Liverpool to get the boat back um, to Belfast, um, and I was just getting these. Phone calls. Now, I was asked to phone Soho Theatre the next day. They messaged me to say, we need to talk about the incident. We've, we've just been made aware of what happened on Saturday night. So I heard nothing on Sunday whatsoever. Um, but the, the crazy thing is, I was emailed by Soho. I wasn't given a phone number right. to call them back on. So this was a, this was a big thing that we're still trying to figure out right. hmm. and looking into. Um, they were asking me to phone them, but they were giving me no way of actually contacting them. And I, I had an email, um, but uh, that, that didn't seem to be having much uh, effect. So by the Tuesday, I think that's whenever Soho released their statement. I um, so. and they Without talking to you? No, without talking <laughs> to me. And they, they basically, in their email, the, the email they sent to me on the Tuesday night, which was about 7 o'clock, 7 p.m., they said, we're going to have to release a statement because you haven't contacted us. Right. I, to which I immediately emailed them and said, you haven't given me a number. And I checked back on all the emails. They never gave me any number. I was like, can we talk now before you release this uh, statement? Because obviously I need to see it. To which point they sent me the statement. But then as they sent me the statement, the statement went live. Oh, shit. Yeah. Hold on. Has the press already started talking about it at this point? I've been messaged by numerous... Uh, but had the headlines come out at that point? Uh, was it before or after the statement? I think, yeah, I think there was press stuff because the guy that I threw out immediately was whisked off by someone to all the newspapers and uh, and he was doing like TV interviews and stuff like that as well mm -hmm. too, which I didn't watch any of. People were people were messaging me going, are you okay? And I was going, why? And they were going, your name's all over the press. You, this, this guy's a... a so to make it clear for the... For the listener, what the press was saying was a uh, comedian throws Jew out of yeah, out that's, Soho Theatre. That was the line they were going with. Yeah. Every headline mentioned that he was a Jew and that's why he was being thrown out. Yeah, that, was, that I targeted a Jewish person in my audience, which is which was insane. Because um, to even suggest that I knew that he was Jewish in itself, I think, is pretty anti-Semitic. Yeah. If you want to use that term in the right context he wasn't um, as they say now visibly jewish like which what, is the he was, was, Israeli. <laughs> was he Israeli? it turned out that he was israeli and that he was in the idf and that his twitter account said that he was a pride zionist right and that he worked for google 
and that he bought the ticket 15 minutes before the show and that it, according to him, he checked performances. He, he consciously checks a lot of performances that he goes to to make sure that he's not going to be offended and that the person isn't pro-Palestinian right? or, mm. you know, anti-genocide. And uh, somebody that works for Google, I just find it, quite suspicious that he didn't check my Instagram. Right. Who's obviously clearly well up on his smartphone. He probably has the smartest of all smartphones. Well, I'm sure he does. And he could have checked my Instagram yeah. instantly. Yeah. Uh, to see that I've been on that march that day. But he plowed on into the show, non like I said, non verbal show, and chose to engage with me, heckle me at the end of a show at the only point where I have a microphone. Right. Because I have no mic for the whole show. It's completely silent. Um, so then, uh, I mean, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I, I thankfully have really only been caught up in minor versions, very, very minor versions of what you have been through. I mean, one of the things about it is that, in my experience, that it stops you thinking straight, really, mm. that you are, you, you are, if you're, a decent human being, you are beset with so many conflicting emotions, really, mm. of, of kind yeah. of annoyance with yourself, of shame, of anger, of rage. Mm. And it stops you. And I think certainly in a political sense, you, you know, when we talk a lot about the attacks on Corbyn, for instance, to jump to that, that that was a kind of deliberate tactic that they know that you can't, it's hard to make the right decisions, if there is a right decision about mm. this situation. I don't mean, am I putting words in your mouth or do you feel that? Or how did you feel? Afterwards? Yeah. Uh, it, it felt and still does to a certain degree, although I'm a lot more educated in the entire situation of what's happening uh, over there and the tactics that are being used. But at the time, it just felt surreal because, like I said, there was people... Yeah. Like the show... Apart from that one incident at the end, the whole show went great. Yeah, the whole, yeah. you know, so people and afterwards in Soho Bar, people coming up and thanking me and after. But then yeah. whenever I saw what was happening, the emails I received were just horrendous. I mean, it was just all. Oh, that's scary. I mean, it's, it's, the, I mean, I mean, at the very least, when you get emails, in my day, it used to be letters um, <laughs> like that. I mean, just to be so somebody feeling yeah. that level of. Yeah. Vitriol, hatred yeah. towards you is yeah. in itself profoundly upsetting. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. And it makes you extremely paranoid as well. You yeah. know, I mean, I was even getting the boat home that night after I, I had to sit and go through. I tried not to read a lot of the emails, but I had to physically go through them. It was, it was about nearly 3,000. And I just sat Fuck. waiting to get on the boat, just going through all these emails, delete, 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 delete. And, you know, some of them I could read the start of the rant. And it was straight Do you away. think these were, I mean, these had come just from reading the coverage, or do you think yeah. this was part of an organization? Well, I, I have no or idea. Part of an to be like, I, I mean, I'm so naive to all this that I, yeah. even people were saying, oh, this is a setup. This has to have been a setup. Yeah. And I'm like, what? Yeah. People don't do that. Humans, yeah. human. I am yeah. very much a naive yeah. idiot clown at yeah. heart. And I would never dream. You clown. That, yeah, super, <laughs> you crazy clown. That someone would plant themselves in an audience to do yeah. that. But a lot of people have been suggesting this and the further yeah. it gets away from it, the further I'm away from what happened that night, I'm like, you know, the Columbo heads start kicking in. Yeah. Like, hang on, wait a minute. Yeah. This is very suspicious, a lot of it. Well, this is I have no idea. Where the CAA come, yeah. come in as well, because it was, how, how did they, how did they yeah. get involved? So the, the, the quote unquote, Soho uh, statement said that they were taking advice from the CIA. Oh, fuck's sake. Actually said in their actual really? public quote, we are seeking advice from the CIA. No, I have no idea yeah. who the CIA was. Remind I, us, Alexia. The CIA uh, is a, an organization that was founded in 2014 after one of uh, Israel's earlier incursions into Gaza in which they killed several thousands civilians, mostly, again, women and children. And it was supposedly, um, it was supposedly to correct kind of anti-Israel, anti, and therefore anti-Semitic bias in the uh, 
British press. Now, the head of the uh, campaign against anti-Semitism is a guy called Gideon Falter, who is also the co-chair, I think, of something called the uh, Jewish National Fund, an organisation that has been involved in ethnic cleansing of Palestine for more than a century. So you understand that his sympathies are not just a hate, as they present themselves as, a, as an organisation which is rooting out hatred. It is not. It is a pro-Israel lobby group. It exists solely to shut down, to police, to, um, to attack anybody who expresses, uh, uh, either tells the truth about Israel or expresses pro-Palestinian mm -hmm. views. That is the function of the campaign against anti-Semitism. And of course, they, they also came to the front in conjunct, uh, uh, in, on the, the smears against Jeremy Corbyn in association with the Jewish Labour Movement. The Jewish Labour Movement is allied with the Israeli Labour Party. The Israeli Labour Party is pro-settler, pro-genocide, pro-apartheid, pro-ethnic cleansing. Mm. That is the so-called campaign against anti-Semitism. Now, obviously... Uh, in the um, Western press, for whatever reasons, this group is treated like, say, an animal rights group that is only motivated by the feelings of animals, that they have no political agenda, they have yeah. a massive political agenda. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the campaign against anti-Semitism. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then recently, asked, you know, a couple of months after your gig, Gideon Falter, co-founder of CAA, was was caught up in a... He was mm. caught oh, no, trying yeah. to manipulate video to make it look like the police were being anti-Semitic to him, kicking him, not letting, he, yeah. not letting guess, him well, cross the road and all that. I think essentially, first of all, I mean, the campaign against anti-Semitism has always campaigned virulently against the pro-Palestine demonstrations have called them hate marches and all, yeah. tried to promote all that, you know, London's not safe... Uh, you know, it's not a safe area for Jews at the weekend, all that bullshit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think Falter was initially trying to provoke an incident, really. You know? mm. And then when that failed, he, he kind of got involved with the police, really. Yeah. So these are the people who advised Soho. Advised yeah, Soho. And Soho took their advice. Yeah. That's fucking shit. Which is yeah. absolutely sick. But, you know, yeah. yeah. And uh, this is Soho Theatre. I've performed for them, like, at least four other times mm -hmm. over the years. I've done shows... Um, and uh, I, yeah, I couldn't believe that they'd throw me under the bus like that, basically, you know. Yeah, um, it is. There's it's been a and very few other comedians or performers have been speaking out about it as well. Ironically, whenever I got cut, so because so then the CAA targeted me for every gig that I was doing, really. Yeah, and I got taken off my Australian tour, I was going to do uh, Fremantle, Melbourne, and uh, Brisbane, and they all cancelled. Um, because of the emails that they were, um, that the CAA were just blanket emailing everyone with all these hit, hitful emails about me. Um, thankfully, a few places didn't, which was eye open. And the whole thing's been very eye open. And a mm -hmm. lot of doors have been shut. Loads of doors have been opening. Right. People are really showing themselves. I think, that, uh, I think there is a change. Yeah. So Utrecht Comedy Festival, for a start, they, they, I messaged them to say, are you going to cancel me? Or am I getting canceled? You know what? Utrecht, and uh, they said um, uh, their email was amazing. I mean, it made me cry, to be honest, because everything was falling apart at this point. All my mm -hmm. gigs were crumbling. And they said, um, oh, we will always believe the artist over the media any right. day. Any day. You're, you're not being cancelled. You're yeah. going to do the gig. I couldn't believe that. It was complete antithesis of what I was hearing from so many other places, you know. I mean, you see, I mean, other com I mean, I was talking to a fairly well-known comedian who's also friends with a very, very, very well-known comedian, and he said both of them will never perform at Soho ever again. Wow. Well, well certainly I won't, but yeah, I, mean, I don't like it anyway. I mean, I, I have to say, yesterday, as a kind of knowing that I was going to interview you today, I like to go down to Soho Theatre and this. And there's my poster on the wall, and I like to sit underneath my poster. <laughs> <laughs> I, and also the, the manager, Esther, after always, uh, she says her uncle won't let us, told her never to let me pay for a coffee. Oh, that's... So either, so either yeah. I get, I can go there and get a free flat white, or sometimes if the staff recognise me, I get the staff discount. So um, I went down to the... So but I went down to Soho Theatre yesterday, cafe, just to sit there underneath my poster. But interestingly enough, they've put... 
stools in the window and they've built a kind of uh, a counter in the window that goes straight into my face. <laughs> so, oh. fuck you, so. <laughs> so my poster, Shapiko Sandy is just above me. And then underneath, you can, the counter goes into my, right into my face. And underneath, you can just see the tattered remnants of a poster saying Alexi Sale. Oh, so you need, you need to make a you need to make a little cardboard uh, <laughs> cut out of yeah. and wear it. So, and yeah, it yeah, yeah. So that's that's uh, probably my last visit. That's my last free coffee in uh, yeah in Soho. But it's, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's I mean, I, I understand in a way that um, I mean, I mean, comedian. I mean, I think that there will be. I think comics will not perform. Uh, you know, will not yeah. perform there anymore. Yeah. Whether speaking out for you, I guess, is a more is taking more of a kind of chance. Yeah, I mean, it's not even a, it's. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's about the just the, just the principle of the thing. You know, yes, I mean, really... it's despicable beyond because... belief for Soho not to at least you know, even if you're not, they haven't got your phone. You know, just put out a statement without speaking to you because they owe you a duty of care. You're their employee. Yeah, aren't yeah, you? yeah, yeah. And they yeah. had watched the show on the Thursday. Yeah, the people that had booked me had come and watched the show. Yeah. So they kind of gave it the thumbs up and said yeah. it was all good, which is weird that uh, then they were so surprised about what happened at the yeah. end. But of course, then it was just blown out of proportion. He immediately said, and and all these, because uh, there was the four people that got up and walked out whenever I said, if nobody yeah. else agrees with it, they kind of backed this up as well. And then there was other third hand evidence that was coming out. The problem was there was so many witnesses who were emailing uh, on their Instagram Email in Soho to say that is not what happened. That is not what happened, and they just chose to ignore a lot of that. And they had staff in the room who I'm sure they it's asked straight away. Staff what happened. in the room. In fact, and I'm not going to name names mainly because I can't remember his name. But <laughs> one of the, the one of the, I'm not even going to say his rank, but one of the staff came up and said to me afterwards in the dressing room, "Thank you, my my grandfather is Palestinian." Oh right. Yeah, and thank you for for doing that. Like kind of whispered it at me, like yeah. he didn't want the rest of his colleagues to find out because right. God knows what is ha- what's going on with Soho. But he came up and made a point of saying thank you for doing that, you know. And uh, I mean, so so again, that was yeah. in my head. The fact that a staff member came up yeah. and said thank you for doing that because you know I've yeah. been Palestinian blood and I appreciate that. Yeah. Um. So it was a bit of it was a bit of a shock when I started receiving all this hate mail and, and read what was what was re- you know recorded as supposedly happening. And you, it was front page news, wasn't it? In, yeah, you know, in certain publications, yeah. Yeah. Every fucking headline, including Guardian, including BBC, would would include the word Jew in the headline. Yeah. Kicked out and implying that it was because he was Jewish. And yeah. only like, the very, the ones that you would expect to be left leaning, it would be like three paragraphs in where they would vaguely explain the actual situation. Mm. Where, like, and not even as much detail. No one got in as much detail as what you've explained today to us. But like yeah. the fact that he was heckling and that the yeah, audience well, booed him and, yeah. and got them out, and maybe it wasn't because he was Jewish. Uh, but every headline, like how the hell was I meant to know he was Jewish? Like seriously, yeah. I mean seriously. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you could argue like because he was having a go at the Palestinian flag. But then what does that fuck say? Off, but then what off. does that say in itself? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's just yeah, sick. Yeah. And it's the fact that I had been on that march that day and I had been on many marches before that. Yeah. And just the hatred. Oh, that was the other thing. The pictures they chose to put of you in these yes, articles was, really... was a screen grab of your video from your Instagram of you on the march. Oh, yeah. You do cool. videos and you're marching and you're talking to your camera going, we're here for Palestine and you're saying something to the camera. Yeah. yeah? And they've chosen to screen grab it when you're <laughs> making an F noise and it looks like you're going, fucking, fucking Israel. Like, yeah. They chose that one photo that makes you look like you're looking angry and hateful. Yeah. Whereas like, if you watch the video, you're actually saying something quite lovely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's just the, the, it's the way the media the works, way though, isn't it? They mm-hmm. paste hate onto us. Yeah. And make us, they're just making, giving us hate where there isn't one. We're, we're, we're pro-Palestinian out of love, out of love for humanity, yeah. out of chil- love for children, out of yeah. love for Palestine, yeah. out of love for justice. It's not, we're not, and you know, it's not that we're anti anything. We're pro Palestine. It's, it's yeah. a positive thing. Yeah. And they it, was, it was the same as the human this. rights marches, uh, just going back to Belfast yeah. as well, you know? I mean, uh, my accent, whenever I was growing up, uh, anybody's accent from the North, if you came over here, you're immediately a terrorist. Yeah. You were yeah. a freaking terrorist, you know? That was it. You were, yeah. you know, you'd either planted a bomb or you had a bomb on you or you were about to do something. Um, the Irish flag was always associated with. 
terrorism as well. The tricolor. Yeah. So I mean, uh, the parallels and then the blueprint. I mean, Belfast really is should be Belfast should be the fucking blueprint for what's happening over yeah. in, in Palestine right now. And and yes. from day one, whenever what happened on day one, well, not day one. It's been happening for over seventy five years. Yeah. But from October the seventh. Uh, yeah, then they would say, what else could we do? We could not fucking kill everybody yeah. for yeah. start, you know. But, what else do you expect us to do? Well, you know, like, not made of 15,000 fucking yeah, children. Exactly. Be good stuff. And what, and what happened in Belfast was they had to sit down and talk to these people. You had to sit and talk with the IRA, with Sinn Féin. They had to talk yeah. to people. And it just seems to be that it's the same. It's just happening again, but over there. Well, they don't want to talk to them. They're just, everyone's guilty. Everyone's well, a terrorist. Yeah, you know, yeah. Human animals. Um, yeah. You didn't feel, so you, you've you remained silent, silent, I think, until this podcast. I mean, you didn't feel, I mean, I, I wonder whether you didn't feel that you should get your narrative out there. No, because like, to be fair, the newspapers and to be, to see how they were twisting the story in favor of the heckler that I threw yeah. out, I just knew that I was going to, it was going to be a, hatchet job and then yeah. would stitch me up I just didn't want to yeah. didn't want to go near that I, I felt comfortable coming over to talk to you um, because uh, I know your stance but also you know I'm a big fan of your politics anyway and I have been for a long time and I just oh, man, I wanted to meet you in the flesh, <laughs> in the flesh. Um, but uh, I felt I felt this was a safe space and I've been talking to Talal as well and, and you know you approaching me and, and offering this to me but I, I definitely feel like having kept quiet for this length of time, it's all coming out. How, how yes. twisted it all is. Yes, I think the from, world is seeing. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. Totally. It's like I, I liken it to the metaphor in my head is it's a it was an arranged marriage between the two, and there's been um, physical domestic abuse that's been going on right. for over seventy five years. But the curtains are open, and the neighbors can see what's happening now. Right. They can actually see the true story of. Who's yeah. beating up who? Yeah. Who's punching who? Yeah. You know. I agree. But where people, it's coming from. Yeah. People are seeing it now, though. Seeing it, they are seeing it. Because now, yeah, uh, through TV, movies, the media, whatever, over the years, uh, you know, the Israeli, or sorry, the Palestinians have been painted as this. Yeah. You know. But it was this, I, again, I, I hit, you know, I'm drawing the parallels, but Belfast was the same. It was movies, if you were, you know, IRA, yeah. Belfast. Patriot games. Patriot oh, <laughs> with their terrible accents. <laughs> Even the Irish actors have terrible Irish accents. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was, the, that was the thing. They were, they were hiring, they were hiring Dublin actors to do yeah. Belfast accents. Oh, and that was like, you yeah. know, the Belfast accent isn't the easiest accent no. to do. And the Derry accent's even harder to do. Yeah. <laughs> Dairy accent. That's anyone. Nye. Nye. They like Nye. Nye. Yeah. It's not just Palestinians. It's Arabs as well. Yeah. Like they paint Arabs. Exactly. Like, exactly. Which justifies their treatment of Palestine. Yeah. The, um, what, so and it, so strong. what so what's yeah. happening with what's happening with you now? Bring us up to date. Then. Um. Well, uh, I luckily have many um, irons and many fires. So, I mean, I'm an artist myself, a paint. I have a studio in Belfast. So right. to be fair, this is actually encouraging me to, to, to be more creative in that way. You know, um, I, I'm still getting gigs here and there. A few people have, have, have stopped booking me, which is fair. And like I said, a lot, this whole incident and what's well, happening. It's really nice of you to say it's fair. I'm not sure it is. But. Well, it's not. But, I mean, you know, it's showing them to be, you know. Yeah. Well, that's another thing about this whole fucking Michigas, as we say, in uh, you this, this whole mess, this madness, you know, it's uh, it really shows you who you, you know, who's a fucking decent human being yeah. and who isn't. Yeah. As well, I think. I know. If you can't, I, if you can't be on board, this is a genocide, then, yeah. you know, I can't have a for you, really. And it's so many liberal people that I know back home, especially coming from a punk background, you know, being yeah. amongst those sort of people who were, you know, uh, who'd play their dead Kennedy's records to death. And then you're going, well, nice. That, here's yeah. your moment. Yeah. Here's your moment. Yes. To stand up and do yeah. the right thing yeah. and, and fight this whole fight, yeah. you know. And they're not. There's so many people remaining silent, which is just heartbreaking, to be yeah. honest. Um, I mean, you can say it is, there is a, been a massive attempt to intimidate, to silence people, yeah. but... Uh, you know, they, that's, you know, that's the time to speak out. And then, really. the, and then what's happening in the universities as well is yeah. scary because it's like footage that we saw back in the 60s, you know, 
of the police attack, and especially I saw some footage today of the the Dutch police. Yeah, with the sticks, the batons yeah. beating the beating the crap out of the uh, of yeah. the peaceful protests over there. It's kind of a shock. It, it really is. I always thought they were nice. <laughs> the Dutch police, yeah, yeah. apparently not. No. So I mean, so you're not. I mean, you. I mean, you what? I mean, you you're still gigging or? Well, Glastonbury's off the table, but I know oh, you guys are. Like, motherfucker. Oh, like, I mean, I know we're playing it. I know, I know, but like... <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a platform, band, and you know, I know that you guys... The film that I narrated, uh, narrated over Jeremy Corbyn. Oh, yes, I've forgotten about that. Year. Yeah, yeah. Oh, have they? Yeah, they banned it again, according to Norman Thomas, the producer. Oh, Rando, producer of... Of the film, oh, Jeremy Oh, Corbyn. oh right, okay. I did the narration for it, and every few, you know, again, they got the same earache from fucking... Campaign against anti-Semitism, and so they withdrew it last year, and I think they're not going to show it this well, year. Well, uh, yeah, it shocked me. Out. It shocked me that I'm being... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I mean, I'm still performing there. I'm yeah. Like, you cowardly motherfuckers, Blastonbury. You can't somebody if you want. I yeah. don't care. Well, yeah, we, there's going to be an audience with Alexis Sale on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that will be an opportunity for you to... Yeah, address that, hold it. Yeah. yeah. But that shocked me, because you've been playing there for... 13 years. 13 years and in, the, in they, the theater and circus field entertain them. And they get one letter. Parents and, go, oh. and They get one email wow. and, and they weren't even going to tell me that it was an email. It was really twisted the way they, the way, the way but they, they know you, went they know it. who you are. They, I know. And, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't stick out for me. Um, uh, in particular, one person wouldn't, who I know I thought would stick out for me, didn't stick out for me, basically said, um, there's nothing I can do. You know who fucking plays Glassery every year in the same play area as you? Frank Sinatzi. Yeah. Frank Sinatzi. And they're fine with him. Yeah. Yeah. Who's, who's he? He's like if Frank Sinatra and Adolf Hitler had a baby oh, right. and yeah. it's, he yeah. does he does crooning and he sings about, he's, he sings from so, the point of view of Hitler. He does a right. second that's one. That's ironic, I assume. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah of course. It's very, that's right. <laughs> Uh, That's yeah. what all the people say. You know, it's that uh, kind of thing. Uh, yeah, they walked around with a Hitler moustache. Yeah. You know? It's very old school music, old vibes and yeah. uh, whatnot. And, yeah. uh, but, um, That's, I mean, again, Glastonbury, you should be fucking ashamed of yourself. Yeah, they should. They really yeah. should. Uh, especially the fact that the, the ironic thing is that, um, I mean, I know why I was targeted, not just by the CAA, but also by Glastonbury, is that I'm way down the pecking order. I, they don't pay much money to have me there, so yeah. to kick me off wasn't going to cause them any mm. grief. You know, I don't have a huge platform. I, I perform in a couple of the platform stages outside in the right. theatre and circus field. I get people to ride their luck dragons. I, it's a thing that I do with the whole audience from Never Ending Story. But anyway, uh-huh. that's another story. <laughs> but uh, yeah, about four years ago, I had one of the. Um, it was recorded that I had one of the biggest outdoor audiences for for a, for a comedy show for right. a clown show. Right. Which was about uh, 3,000 people all just fucking about having fun. Um, and I wasn't going to do anything political because I don't do anything political in my uh, in my outdoor shows and stuff like that. I was just going to bring a bit of joy to the to the festival. But 13 years I've been doing it. And the fact that they know me and that uh, they know me and they could have stuck up for me and, and said, no, this is not Paul. But um, it was the press office that received the emails and they just went, no, he's gone. But the fact that Lankum are performing, the fact that Ju- I know that Juulipe is pro-Palestinian, yeah. Idols are pro-Palestinian. You know, there's all these other bands. Uh, yeah. I think Bob Villain's performing as well right. too, all pro-Palestinian. And uh, you know they're all going to mention it in their show. Of course, yeah. They're not. It's not going to be broadcast on the BBC. I can tell you that I right wonder, now. Yeah. But it'll be. They'll talk about it on stage. But um, you can see a lot of Palestine flags as well on the end of those long poles. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. how are they flag. going to ban that from Glastonbury? Yeah. They can't. I know they did it with the Euro vision. Yeah, but they're not. That's not a big field, is it? Right? They're never going to ban it from uh, yeah. Glastonbury. But um, they'll probably yeah. find they probably develop the Israelis will develop a bit of software that automatically edits out Palestinian so, yeah. flags. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wouldn't be surprised actually. Yeah, to be honest, yeah. Oh my Pegasus god, that would be. Software. They'd be capable of doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. yeah. Replacing them with the Star of David with the Israeli flag. Maybe they wouldn't get that. Well, maybe yeah. Why not? Yeah, Why yeah. not? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I don't know. Well, thank you very much, Paul. I don't know how long we've we been going. Uh, one hour and a quarter. You were, is that are you? Tell like... us about your punk band because just give them a little plug. Oh yeah, um, yeah. My punk band's called Rhinos. Right. We're a little too. It's just me and another guy, drummer, um, two piece punk band. But uh, yeah, we're touring around. Trying to get more gigs if anybody's booking any gigs out there. We just played in Liverpool, your hometown. 
last week for the first time. Actually, that was our very first time playing on mainland UK. It was in Liverpool. Mm. So yeah, that was uh, that was great. It was a lot. Of I mean, one thing is going to yeah. Where did you play? Where did we play? In a little uh, club called Outpost. I. But it's apparently it's <laughs> apparently it's two doors down from a famous record shop, uh, which Probe. is. Probe. No, it's the the address of the record shop, which is apparently where John Lennon and Paul used to hang out. It's called is it thirty one or thirty eight something? It's a vinyl record shop. Oh, I don't know it's just two doors down. Anyway, right. um, slot buying in the middle of Liverpool, but um, it was great. I had a great time. I mean, the gigs that you have done, you've done some gigs since the since the hoo-ha. Like I said, the Glasgow Comedy Festival didn't cancel me. Right, good they, for them. they specifically said yeah, we are not. People, yeah, because yeah, they received the CAA emails and they really? said, yeah, yeah, and they said no, we're not canceling. Go fuck you. yourselves. Yeah. Go f- yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, go fuck off. Um, the only thing that we they did receive, the only thing that happened, any incident that happened was they got a, a written letter from a cantankerous uh, older man who who sent. Uh, really? Really? Yeah, just and old I've got school. the letter. I still have the letter. Old school. Yeah. Old school. Yeah. Yeah. Stamped addressed envelope. He wasn't he didn't go to the gig, he just He didn't go to the gig, he just sent them a furious letter. Furious letter. <laughs> yeah. And um, what was the vibe like at the gig then? It was fine, it was absolutely fine. The director of the stand comedy club came because I did it in the Take stand. People, yeah. And the director came to see the show just out of curiosity more than anything, and he came up to me afterwards and was like, Is that it? <laughs> well, yeah. that was it. What was the what was the problem? And I was going, I know, exactly. Yeah. And I explained to him, this guy heckled me. He was just a hateful heckler, yeah. and I did what any stand-up comedian does in that situation. I kicked him out. Yeah. The staff weren't kicking him out, so I got rid of him. And I mean, I've kicked many people out of my shows over the years. I don't put up with bullies in my show. Right. If they're ruining the whole show for everybody else, then I just get rid of the rotten apples out of the, right. out of the bowl. I just tell them to go because, you know, especially if it's a solo show. I don't kick them out if it's a mixed bill show. If I'm no, doing a mixed bill, that would be a bit shit, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, but whenever it's your when it's your show and you've yeah. just done yeah. one hour, yeah. then you're like, just fuck off, you know, just yeah. go. I, I mean, the only, when I used to like the really big rooms, what it was, uh, if I had a heckler, because they, 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 they were always drunk, really. They, uh, yeah. You know, so when they went to the toilet, then they would go back, go to the foyer with the security and then not let them back in. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> that was what Linda did. That was yeah. Linda's wrong. Yeah. I mean, um, I've, I've incited some really hateful people in my shows by just yeah. simply performing innocent stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's not my... I don't... Yeah, you know, but I, I mean, uh, Glasgow, yeah. Glasgow, one time up in Glasgow, the whole audience split into two and they were screaming amongst one another. Right. I felt like... I felt like mis- that's the game, isn't it? In your type of comedy. Yeah. It's not... It's about, not for everyone. Yeah, but it's also... Not, it's also not about the that, the guy going on and complaining about it. That is the experience of being an artist in a yeah. show... In a member of the audience in a show like yours. Yeah. And it's not about fucking... Yeah. Ugh. But it split the audience. I was doing the panda hands bit. I do this bit where I have pandas on my hands and I just sing panda hands to a lot of famous theme tunes like right. <laughs> Carnation Street. Um, uh, I can't remember. The A-Team. All sorts of weird random shit. And it's silly. It is just silly. And it is the finale of the show in Glasgow. This was a few years ago. And these burly um, testosterone blokes... Who were clearly at the wrong show anyway. Yeah. They just started heckling me and shouting, telling me to fuck off, fuck off, right? Get off the fuck your shit. You got a fucking shit. To which point, the other half of the audience started heckling them to shut up. And then this mini kind of like verbal riot started while I'm kind of carrying on <laughs> like <laughs> the fucking Titanic Orchestra <laughs> while all the audience is <laughs> sinking. <laughs> but the audience is sinking around me. I'm having a great time on the stilts. <laughs> <laughs> on the on the stage, and I'm just carrying on with my song while all this fucking chaos is happening. Right, it was from an anthropological point of view, it was fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Wow! So it's just weird how innocent stuff like that can incite aggression and adults. yeah. Well, it's yeah, but it's also in your case. It's uh, in the case of this particular yeah. controversy. It's about trying to cover up genocide, isn't it? Yeah. Really? I mean, that's that's all. All this shit is about in the end is. Is that really? Uh, if I can just say one more thing, because um, you mentioned earlier, you didn't, you don't have any, you never had any management or anything. No, that, that gives you the freedom because I, I follow you on on the Instagram, and uh, yeah. I encourage our listeners to do the same and show Paul some love. But you're very 
vocal on there and you share content about Palestine and Hell Gaza. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I've just noticed how many comedians don't do that. Yeah. And um, I have a friend who works at one of the big agencies and she's like, yeah, we tell them not to. Mm. We, they're, they're controlled by their agents and yeah. told, if you do that, we're going to probably drop you. Yeah. And it's comedians who you... People like Joe Lysett really makes me angry and Sarah Pascoe because they've always been political comedians. Mm. They've always done things about social justice. You know, especially Lysett had a whole TV show about mm-hmm. was it writing wrongs in society. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not a single peep about Palestine. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Ever on his socials. And it yeah. just and confounds you, yeah. me because you that's your whole shtick. It's yeah. being right righteous and Fucking Gary Lineker can do it. You can, but yeah, I mean, you will get here, right? I mean, you will. Yeah. It's not a, you know, it is. It takes courage, but then that's, you know, that's why we're comedians. Well, it's it's just shows you how corporate comedy has become. That's all. How true, fucking yeah. corporate it's become yeah. over the years, you know. Like I don't know what agencies existed whenever you started with the alternative, uh, with the comic strip and no. stuff like that. But, you know, there wasn't any. There was only old-fashioned theatrical yeah. agents, really. So yeah, that whole be a the. Um, the uh, the the Avalons and the uh, open mics and United the, Artists, yeah, it? and Jonathan Thoday and all those all those um, they came, all that came later, really. Oh, right, okay, okay. Yeah, there was no there was no agencies then. It was yeah, because we were inventing it all. But mm. it, yeah, it happened soon enough, really. All right, Paul. Thank you very much. I think that's a. I mean, I, mean, I think this is going for me anyway. It was a fascinating talking no, to you. Thank also, you. Hopefully, it'll make it. An amazing podcast, and hopefully, be also be an answer with it. Antidote to the lies and uh, propaganda of the yeah. pro genocidists. Yeah, yeah. I hope this helps getting your story out there. Yeah, I'm so I sorry hope. for all that shit you've been through. So yeah, no, sucks. thank you, and thanks for letting me explain. Oh hell no! What happened? Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm just a client. <laughs> trying to bring a bit of joy. Yeah. I'm just a clown looking at another clown. Uh, <laughs> just want to bring some joy into the world and another clown. Just trying to tell another clown. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank All right. You. No, thank you. Okay, that was um, Paul Curry's story. Uh, I don't know, it's a, a story very much of uh, modern Britain. And mm. actually, I was just saying at the Andrew Feinstein launch, I was giving an interview to the Camden New Journal and our local paper and just saying how this era of, that we're living through of, of repression, particularly of pro-Palestinian voices, is it poisons our culture. It poisons our cultural discourse. It poisons the national conversation by, uh, you know, by limiting speech, by punishing people who supposedly transgress. And even those com- even those performers, not just comedians, who don't speak out because they're rightly afraid, uh, and, you know, they're afraid anyway, um, it, it poisons them as well. I think it eats, it corrodes at their soul if they, Stay silent on a on a on a genocide, um, but that's what's happening really. And so the whole the whole aggressive um, McCarthyite stance of the Israel lobby really um, really uh, poisons our sours our national conversation. I think. Um, and yeah, that's uh, that's episode fifty. It's a good one to have us episode fifty. We've we've evolved, haven't we? We've we've learned. We've over it's the years been a journey, as you like to say. Yeah, it's been uh, a journey. <laughs> it, it is really. Thank you, everyone who listens and has yeah. supported us and helped us grow because it feels it, yeah. It started as these little scripted tidbits that we'd put <laughs> out, and then Seems became like loose. That. Yeah. And now, um, you know, it's this tightly manufa- uh, tightly manicured <laughs> machine of thoughts. But it, and- it's, it, it, I mean, it's not, you know, we don't have massive, you know, I, I, looking at figures and that, they're not massive. But, we, you know, I mean, every, you, you know, most people at that launch of Andrew Feinstein's um, campaign today, you know, is a, is, a, is a listener or a watcher of the podcast. 
Oh yeah. So it's it's a, it's certainly a, a voice on the left. It's an additional. And uh, speaking of that, I, I was looking at the um, comments on YouTube of the other the podcast that we did with uh, Fred West, and I thought with who I just. Fred Weston. Fred Weston, yeah. And I just thought the comments were so, some of the comments were so interesting and so, you know, added to the conversation, really. Um, obviously, not the ones say, why didn't you go and fight in Gaza? But, they, um, <laughs> uh, you know, that actually, I, I think I may, I thought I could respond in the reply. In the, but then I thought, well, I'll, I'll respond. Oh, interesting. That's cool. For, yeah, I'll do it. Here, you know, not now, but next time. Oh, okay. Let's we do can that. do a reflection as well because it yeah, was a bit yeah. of a. I guess it was provocative, not necessarily in that it was it, it overly angered people or anything, but it was made people. Yeah, like the some of the most thought out and long yeah, comments because I've it ever was, seen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, because it was. Again, I don't know how many people have you know listened to it, but I mean, it's. Yeah, because of the nature of that particular podcast that it appealed to people, you know, whereas the, the Cycling to Gaza one is is more emotional and is more of a, you know, it's, it's got a kind of mass appeal. This one, um, the, 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 the Fred Weston one appealed, I guess, to people who are more invested in politics and therefore have a kind of position, really. And I just thought some of their, some of their replies were really interesting and worthy of, Further discussion, even some of the, to a degree, some of the negative ones. When, yeah, um, I'll do that next. I would do one. Just with we can do it. Yeah, we'll do a mini episode, uh, episode fifty-one. We can do a yeah. reflections on that and our first fifty episodes. Why not? That yeah, could be a fun one. Um, it? Yeah, fuck, we've been all over the fucking place, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah, it's been, maybe I mean the bike rides are separate. Aren't they? I could we could do an episode. I'll get a list of all our episodes, all our guests, and maybe I'll just fire them at you and get yeah, your reflections. I don't, I don't remember these, some of these people uh, exactly. Yeah, um, fifty episodes. Thank you once again, everyone who's listened and subscribes and helps us on the Patreon, Patreon dot yeah. com forward slash Alexi Sale Podcast. Alexi, I need you to give me thirty seconds because I just got a call from a delivery person at the door. I need to go oh, right. get this package. <laughs> the podcast, yeah. No, no, just bear with me one minute. Sorry, man. All right. While he's getting the delivery, I'll sing the Karen song from the Thripney Opera. The troops live under the cannon's thunder from Sim to Cooch Bay Ha. Moving from place to place, when they come face to face with a different breed of fellow, whose skins are black or yellow, they quick as winking chop them into beefsteak. Ta ta, ba ba da ba, ba ba da ba da ba da ba da ba, ba ba da ba da ba da bum 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 bum. I can't remember the verse. Uh, Tony's present, Jimmy's not. A... Georgie was shot for looting. But young men's blood goes on being spread, and the army goes on Sorry, ahead our, our buzzer's recruiting. Not I'm well, singing. I had to run all the I'm way singing. downstairs. Sorry, I'm singing, I'm singing to the people about. I'm doing the exception of the opera for the people. <laughs> <laughs> and the yeah. army goes on ahead recruiting. There you go. The troops live under the cannon's thunder from Sim to Cooch Beha. Moving from place to place when they come face to face with a different breed of fellow whose skins are black or yellow. They quick as winking, chop them into beefsteak. Ta ta. What was it? Haven't you haven't delivered? Just some fucking stupid shit I bought online. All right. I can't even remember what half it is. I'll see. I recognise that song. Yeah, it's a canon song from the Trigrosian Opera. It's probably oh, somebody fucking does. Brecht. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I watched that film after our Brecht episode with oh, um, with Raoul. What's his Which name? Film? Uh, we did a Brecht episode. Yeah, we did a Brecht episode of this show, and. Gomez from the Adams family, something Raoul. Oh he, yeah, he, oh god, he died quite young, didn't he? Uh, not Raoul Blazers. He, he was brilliant. No. Yeah, yes, yes, amazing. As uh, it's the Thrippany Opera. What's the name of the bloody 
film. Doesn't matter. So you carried on, did you, while I was running up and down? Yes, I sang them a song while you were running up and down. Okay. <laughs> um, That's the kind of value you get, people. <laughs> Can't wait to listen back to that and decide whether I'm keeping it in. <laughs> um, did I adver- Did I promote the Patreon? You mentioned it. I did mention it. Patreon.com forward slash Let's Sell Podcast. Give us a look on there. I was listening to David cross's podcast he has a new podcast do you know david cross oh uh, yeah uh, from he he plays the i was watching yesterday i was funnily enough i was watching um kung fu panda oh yeah and he <laughs> plays the crane and in kung fu panda and of course i think and of course crane is the style I, you know i, I, you I do, do oh. crane style kung fu so um i think he yeah. plays the crane well, he's in arrested development as well oh him right and his great stand-up, really funny, surreal stand-up. And okay. He was talking about the young ones really fondly. Oh, really? Oh, well. He was doing an interview with Bobby Moynihan from Saturday Night Live and there brought up the young ones on a tangent and seemed very fond of it. Well, um, maybe we could get him to come on our Maybe we could get him. Podcast. Get some Hollywood. Yeah, get some of that fucking Hollywood glamour. On the potty, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, all right, anything else? Any other business? I did think of something, but I've forgotten what it was. Um, so we'll do a 50 episodes reflection mm. special. Uh, we always suggest to our listeners to donate to medical aid for Palestinians if Definitely. they have any spare care cash. Prioritize that over our Patreon, I say. Um, we'll do both. Oh. Do you want to quickly talk about the ICC's arrest warrants? <laughs> um, on well, Netanyahu I don't know. And the um, leader. I don't know. We'll see. Really, I I I feel nervous about both all these. Uh, I I mean, I feel nervous about all these institutions like the ICJ and the ICC, whether ultimately they will let us down really i don't know how i don't know quite know what part they play certainly people are quite skeptical about some people are quite skeptical about karim khan kc i mean and certainly on the face of it it seems like a a marvelous development and um you know both the icj saying there's a plausible case for genocide and that also that mm. um israel is you know netanyahu and uh, benny Gen- um Yo, of gallant of uh, committing war crimes seems criminals. indisputable, really. Criminal. Criminals. And as uh, Jonathan Cook, Cook said in his, you know, there's, I mean, uh, somebody said there's no comparison between Hamas and Israel. I think Biden said that. No, he's right. Israel is much, much worse. Mm. And um, so uh, we'll see, really. Yeah. I mean, we could maybe get an international lawyer on. And um, maybe, I mean, Amal Clooney is at Doughty Street Chambers, so she's just down the road. So if she she was one of the people who recommended that, uh, along with Helena Kennedy, I suppose we could get Helena Kennedy on in there. Where, um, she, I, I was going to bring Clooney up because everyone had been having a go at her for being yes. silent about Palestine. And everyone was yeah. like, you should boycott her. And I did find it curious that she wasn't saying anything, yeah. but it turns out she was... She was working away in the shadows, putting yeah. the case together. To, uh, yeah. Was restricted, couldn't talk about things, because yeah. it was a uh, case right. she was working on. Right. Um, so, yeah, we're good, you know, we're good. well done, Amal Clooney. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to have a... I, I'm, I was curious, because they can make these judgments, these laws, you know and these arrest warrants, but who is it that has to enact them? Who? who? Uh, they're local. I mean, they are both Israel and the United States are not signatories to the International Criminal Court. So theoretically, it's up to local police forces to enforce this. So if, um, Fuck. if Benjamin Netanyahu goes on his holidays to Puerto Bonus, then theoretically the, uh, right. the Guardia Civil could uh, feel his collar. So in effect, it's just a symbolic gesture unless he takes a holiday. It's, well, I mean, even, I mean, Britain theoretically, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, 
I know you think I'm great, everybody, but I'm not. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My knowledge of international <laughs> jurisprudence is, you know, yeah, yeah, while, yeah. while it's, 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 uh, it's, you know, it's serviceable, it's probably not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't cast myself as an expert. But, um, you know, theoretically, since Britain is a signatory, if, if Netanyahu comes to Britain, uh, he, he could be arrested. Yeah. You know, I want to see a movie of an Israeli cop who decides to arrest Netanyahu yeah. and has to go through gauntlets, <laughs> a gauntlet of, of, you know, all the yeah. other loyal police and army, and he's trying to smuggle Netanyahu out of the country. Yeah. But theoretically, I mean, I think, Joaquin, you know, you see these spokespeople sometimes, they're clearly British, or, you know, these people, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, sh- they should be arrested, you know, if they ever return to Britain. They should immediately be re- arrested mm. for fighting for, for and I, IDF uh, and soldiers. One. Yeah, been fighting for the IDF. They should be immediately arrested. It seems to me it's it is it is um, we, we're living in a time of double standards, and it's yeah, it's infuriating. Oh hell yeah! But we okay. could maybe we could let's get a let's see if Helena Kennedy wants to come on and talk about yes, but uh, you see. For now, thank you to Paul Curry for choosing us to share his story. Yeah. And solidarity with him. If you out there run any yeah. comedy shows or, or are involved in any comedy festivals, He's a lovely guy. make sure the people running those festivals and shows aren't buying into the bullshit that has befallen him. And we hope um this is i don't know we hope this helps wash away that stain that they fucking yeah i mean it's a, well yeah i'm mean, god it seems like we could talk forever i mean it's a, he chose and he was advised not to speak mm. right away i'm not sure that was the right advice really but nevertheless that's what he chose to do but when we reached out he was like this yeah he, it was he was like this will be the safe he wanted yeah, to do it in a safe, safe space. space. Yeah. I just think, yeah. I mean, just thinking about Andrew Feinstein's campaign, and I think you've got, a, you know, I, I think if anybody's standing against the power, anywhere, any candidate, you've got to have like a rapid reaction force, definitely. some They will. You will know that shit will be pumped out about, about you, and you've got to respond to that right away, I think. And yeah. Crush that shit. And I think any politician... Anybody standing on our side in this upcoming elections really needs to take that right lesson away. on board and right away, fucking yeah. But you know, hindsight is a lot easier to. Uh, well, how does the saying go? Hindsight is a lot clearer down the, the down the road than a pork pie. Then yeah, that's the one. Yep, that's yep. the hindsight saying that everyone knows. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Episode fifty, we did it. Let's tie a ribbon on it. Bye bye. You've been listening to the Alexis Hell Podcast. This show is produced and edited by Talal Karkuti. Music by Tarbush Records. Thanks to Audio Boom for hosting us. Please keep your emails coming in at alexishellpodcast at gmail.com. Goodbye.